<laughs> okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? We do have limited amount of time. Welcome, everybody. This is the uh, the meeting of the uh, uh, something that we do every year as part of the Project and Community Workshop and now the Rubin Community Workshop uh, to have a meeting of the Science Advisory Committee. This is a, a committee that that uh, advises, as its name applies, both the construction project and the uh, uh, operations. Um, the, um, the, we have members of the Science Advisory Committee both in person and on Zoom. And uh, um, because, of the, uh, because of the travel snafus that many people have run into, a, a few people uh, who were to be here are attending by Zoom. Uh, but welcome everybody. So the list that you currently see on the screen of the people who are here and on Zoom is not exactly correct, but um, so um, between between everybody, um, we basically have uh, everybody here. Um, so um, just uh, all sessions uh, start in the uh, same way with a reminder of the code of conduct. Uh, we have, um, I, I think those of you who were at the plenary session this morning I've heard this already. Uh, harassment and unprofessional conduct is not permitted. And if there are any problems, there's a list of individuals, include, including Ron Paul Gill, who's in the room with us here, uh, to, to reach out to should that should that come up. And uh, and for virtual participation, I think the the guidelines are here. If you're if you are not speaking, uh, please mute yourself. If you'd like to uh, jump in, of course, unmute yourself. Uh, in in Physically in this room, if you're on the side of the room that I am standing right now, I believe you're being picked up by the microphone here. Those folks over there uh, will not be heard. So uh, either walk over or uh, uh, any questions or, or things will be uh, uh, taken care of. For those people who are uh, taking part remotely, uh, you can either use the Slack space uh, for this meeting or uh, use the Zoom chat feature and uh, Henry and Katrin are, are both keeping an eye on that, so we'll make sure uh, that that happens. So our schedule for today is as follows. We have an hour and a half. Uh, there's a sort of semi-infinite number of things we might talk about, uh, but we're gonna be start by hearing from um, Bob Blum and uh, Phil Marshall. Bob was here 20 seconds ago. Oh, <laughs> it vanished again. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, the, the transition uh, from uh, commissions to routine commissioning to routine operations. That's uh, what what that actually means, and I think it's something that the um, the SAC has been long interested in. Uh, then we're going to hear from uh, Igor Igor Andreoni representing the users committee and uh, and um, part of an ongoing conversation, as it were, between the SAC and the users committee. We'll talk about that, and then. Uh, then we'll hear from the uh, representatives of the Rubin data management team, um, uh, some combination of Leanne, Eric, and Lynn. Uh, Eric and Lynn are, are here, and uh, I think Leanne may be taking part remotely. In any case, that, that, that's the plan. Uh, the idea is to have this discussion-based. I do. This is an open meeting for, for everybody, but the members of the Science Advi Advisory Committee have mostly are physically sitting here. Uh, um, I think, um, Risa, if you'd like to come and join us over here, that, that would be great as, as a member of, of this group. Uh, and of course, those uh, members of the SAC uh, who are remote, um, don't be shy, just um, unmute yourself and, and speak up if and when uh, questions come up. Again, the idea is to have uh, plenty of discussion with that. I think I would like to get started. Um, so Bob, I think we're gonna, we have your slides uploaded, but we'll have to room figure out how to actually get them again. It's escape. Who's, how do I, sorry, I'm not, I'm not a, um, not a user of Windows, so how do I get my slides already on the screen to, uh, yes, I think everything on here. Yes, there it is. This is the presentation. Go for it. Thank you. Do I need a mic? Uh, no, the mic is here. Mics are up. Oh, yeah, go for it. Uh, is Joko online? Yeah, Joko. I saw his name. Okay. Good. So oh, I did. Joko uh, and Phil can feel free to jump in. Look, um, 
as we just talked about in the plenary, it's super exciting. We're getting really close. And uh, one of the things we want to make sure that we as an observatory, and that's uh, the project and the ops team and the community, are clear on what it means to be able to start the survey and that we're ready to start taking data for the 10 year LSST. Um, and I think most of us have a sense of what that is and even more than a sense, there's, enough, there's a lot of things written down that are, pre, you know, that are prerequisites that will have to be done. Um, but then there is this gray area when we get uh, the handover of the construction that we have a system that works. How are we really sure that the, that the team is ready and the community are ready to start the survey? And that, so that's the topic today. And, and I think we have time to figure this out or clarify it. I wouldn't say we're certainly not starting from the beginning. We're starting way down the line on this conversation. But it's time that we, what we really want to do is bring everyone together so they understand what that means. And so we can speak concisely of what the criteria are so that when, when uh, the clock is ticking later next year and everyone's ready for the data, we'll be able to cl you know, clearly say, remember, this is what we said we needed to do. And that's what we're working on. And we're going to get there. If Victor Crabendam was here, he would tell you absolutely uh, that the project is going to deliver the system it said it was going to deliver. And so we're counting on that happening. And now we're talking about refining this conversation about really what it means to start operations after that happens. Uh, so we have for a long time had this document, SITCOM 005, which outlines 10 high level, uh, this says points, points or areas that will be done uh, by the handover at the end and will we'll lead to the handover specifically. And so you can actually go look at these and see what they are. And we have, uh, we started this some time ago and we have left it for a while and now we're coming back to it and we're gonna start revising each one of those things uh, as we go forward and, and make sure that we all are on the same page about what it means to, to finish. And so these are the 10 things. The first nine are the, for the construction project to get through and the last one, uh, is for the operations team to make sure it has the team, the plan, uh, the staff, the training all in progress. And so I don't need to go through all these in detail, but you know, there's things like uh, the science, the system requirements document and the science requirements document and what it means to get through verification and validation at the end of commissioning. So that, that expands into a long list of there are many, many things. many things in there. And I'll right. say a few more words about that, right. about how we're going to check those off right, right. Uh, as we go forward. Uh, there's the system specification. So it, all the science requirements flow down into system requirements that then said, this is what this part of the system should be like or do. Uh, there's verification of the data processing and the products that we're going to put out and the services. There's the science quality data assessment. These are things that are going to come out of the commissioning team, the science validation, uh, team, the science validation surveys. Uh, you know, a straightforward one in principle, but one that takes a lot of work is making sure everything is captured and documented and that we have it going forward as an archive. So we understand, not only we understand the system now, but in 10 years from now, we can, we can go back and tell people what, what was built and how. Uh, we have uh, our uh, education program. That was actually completed and went through a verification process and handed over to operations. The EPO team has been on operations uh, for more than a year now. Uh, and then there's the as-built record and all the modifications. That's again, something fairly simple in, in principle, but uh, it's something that takes real effort in practice. So uh, the overall objective, I think Victor actually did write this slide, of the construction project has not changed. We're gonna deliver Ruben operations, a working system that's capable of delivering images, meeting the science requirements, document specifications with sufficient efficiency to conduct the 10 year survey. So it'll be completed and verified and validated. Uh, that's what you know, much of the team is concentrating on right now as we go through commissioning camera and then LSST cam. Uh, you know, we're, we're right now at system integration. We're gonna put it all together. We're gonna go on Sky and make it work. We're gonna commission uh, parts of the system with commissioning camera. We'll take that off and put LSST cam on, continue the commissioning, uh, and then go into the final science validation part of that end of that commissioning and make sure the data that we're taking routinely is the data that we want in the LSST. 
So it's a, a combination of capability for successful system first light and the reliability to proceed into operations, right? It, not only can we do it once with everyone focused on it, but we deliver a system that will, will reliably do this as we go forward. So for many years, we talked about handover as a single thing. We, we build it, we verify it, we're done. There's an event, maybe a review, and then the next day we're in operations. I, that was a very useful you know, way to discuss things leading up to a certain point. It's no longer enough, right? The, the, we actually have to figure out how we're gonna do this. And so uh, it's gonna be a process, basically starting almost from right now and through till we're, we're done and the final administrative closeout is done sometime well after operations starts. All the final contracts are closed out. Victor does all the things he has to do to finish all the things that he said he would do. Uh, NSF and DOE are happy with, with what, what we did. Uh, but in the meantime, we're actually already observing. Uh, so this will happen over a period of time. Um, uh, and so it's not, um, it's not a single event, but a process. We are proposing, and we have now pretty much put this in motion, a series of construction completeness reviews, CCR. So CCR one through CCR four, which I'll describe in just a, a second. Well, here they are. Um, we hope that you know we'll basically get a review committee that goes through this with us, so that the same people that are that are helping us get through these different CCRs are the ones with the knowledge uh, from prior reviews and prior experience with us through our reviews uh, to be able to usefully guide us uh, through this process. So, can I interrupt with sure. a question? Interrupt any time. Do, do you imagine that these? Reviews are formally overseen by the agencies. Oh, that, absolutely. That these are agencies and, yes. and these are external committees. Yes. By some definition of yep. external. Yeah. Okay. Just, just, they will be just like our joint uh, status reviews, our joint agency independent panels, mm -hmm. and our joint operations reviews. Mm -hmm. And so many of the people we envision and hope will be drawn from those re uh, review committees that will, will get us through this. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the exception, perhaps, of this last one, CCR4, which you'll see in the schedule in just a second, is, is really administrative. It's after all the real action has happened. So this, this table, which will probably undergo some revision at some point as we get to the end, uh, but I think it's a pretty good place to start, uh, shows what we're talking about. So right away, we're talking about just a few months, CCR1. So this is going to be uh, hopefully at the end of our ComCam campaign. Uh, with an operational telescope and LSST cam ready in Chile. Um, uh, there will be a bunch of stuff that, that we will show the committee that we hope they can uh, uh, agree that we're ready to uh, hand off eventually. Uh, and that the test plans and other things um, and the scope of what we need to complete to get out here are, are clearly identified and agreed upon. So there would be a question, is the installation of the main camera it's really a deadline, right? I mean, independent of what you find in the first with the ComCam data, even if the data doesn't look like you expect it, you will just take it off and, or is it, is there a quality like thing where you say ComCam has to work? No, com way? ComCam is to help us get along the way. And if at some point it doesn't, it's not helping us anymore and we make, the, and the decision is that LSST cam is ready. And even though we still have some <laughs> issues, let's put LSST cam on and continue because I mean, in some in some world view that was only about six months or eight months old, that's what we were going to do. We weren't even going to put ComCam on. So there is no specific thing that we have to get to ComCam. We hope that things go well with ComCam and we get that initial part of the integration uh, done on Sky and that there's this opportunity to produce a data set for the community. That's a hope. That's, that's added. But it's really LSS TCAM should drive us uh, forward uh, to keep on schedule. ComCam also buys us thinking time. Yeah. Okay. You want to repeat the question, repeat the statement. Ro uh, Robert. Folks there are not, are not heard on Zoom. Well, you can repeat it then. Okay. <laughs> um, Robert. Yeah, Robert. Uh, go, go ahead, why don't you do it? Robert was just reminding us that the ComCam on Sky will allow us some thinking time as we get to the next steps of, of how we're going to go forward. And that's, that's true. Uh, okay, and then uh, a, a less than a year from now, we'll meet again in Chile for CCR2, okay? 
this is really where we start knocking off. Uh, we talked about those diagrams, those documents that have all the specifications and requirements. Hopefully we knock off a bunch of those that are, that are verified up to this point and we get those done. So you can imagine a big uh, kind of red, green, yellow uh, billboard that has all the requirements on them. And at some point we start just getting as many green as we can and knocking them off. And at that point, the idea would be we really understand the handover conditions and we did have enough of the system uh, checked off that we would identify the key things that need to be done through this last phase of, of commissioning to get us to the end. Uh, and then we would, we would uh, verify and validate that uh, through the review CCR3, which would be about a year from now as currently planned. And then the fourth one is the uh, final accounting and reporting uh, that could be well into the uh, early period of operations. That's really administrative thing being, being handed off. So that's the overall context of construction completeness. Part of this uh, CCR3 will be a detailed joint review about the operations readiness that we can show we have the team and the plan together, you know, the profile, everything working uh, and ready to go. And, and again, CCR4 sounds like administ purely administrative, yeah. as, as it were. Is there, is there anything? We assume anything it's a virtual review. We assume that that's just taking care of all the uh, the kind of the documentation, the administrative things with the agencies that have to close out the construction project. Does it include also some spillover maybe in case something wasn't solved during the CCR? Well, uh, I think inevitably there's going to be some things that we'll accept to go into operations that haven't solved. And remember the, the construction team's stated goal, and, I, and I'm confident they'll reach it, is that we'll have the right system that we've always said we have going into it. Uh, but after all, some of the science requirements we won't be able to uh, actually verify for some years, right? So there will certainly be some aspects of the overall survey uh, that we'll continue to keep an eye on going forward. I think uh, unless something drastic changes, and, and I don't see what that is at this point, you know, the operations team is going to take over about a year from now, and then it's going to be all about starting to take survey data. And there may be things that we have to keep working on. Uh, but we'll keep doing that. We've always known that any operations team is like that, right? Any any facility that has been commissioned and handed over that still has things that it works on going forward. So, but that the statement is: should that be successful, construction is formally complete in, yep. a, in an administrative sense, at least at that point. Well, the handover is here, and then it's formally complete here. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, acceptance. Handover uh, would be that the MRAC is closed out and approved by the NSF, so they literally sign off on it. As you know, the camera has already closed out. That was some time ago. Uh, our DRO, uh, DOE colleagues have done this before, and they, they know how to get things done. Um, so even though we have a lot to do with the camera yet, that official project has been, um, has been closed out, and in some sense, they re really are in operations phase in the DOE uh, context. Uh, once the agencies have approved this, uh, this would define the as-built system that Ruben Operations will receive. And at that point, we'll know what's ahead of us and we'll know what the character of the system is and we'll be able to say uh, for sure what the criteria to start the survey are. And that's, that last part is what we're, we're, we're starting to, to um, delineate and, and clarify right now. So we're all clear and we can talk to you, the community, concisely and clearly about it. What, you know, there won't be any like, well, what do you mean you're not starting? Say, well, remember, we had to do this, this, and this. And hopefully that this, this, and this really is three or four things, not, not a whole long list of details. Uh, we will work with our Slack and OR lab leadership colleagues uh, to ensure that the state of the subsystem that those labs are receiving uh, is what they're expecting, uh, that uh, we've taken care of all the given staff and transitions and, and find all that up. And I think that's that part of it's actually well in hand already. Um, and then here's here here's the addressing the question that just came up actually provide for any follow up on any residual items. Uh, this is just a list of a long thing. I, I won't go through it. You can look back at the slides if you want. But there's a lot of things coming from the construction project that will be have to be handed over either to Slack, Slack or to Noir Lab, and we'll take care of all those things as well. What is cost? COS is Noir Lab's Central Operations Services. So they're all our facilities groups. So they're the folks, no matter which program you work on in Noir Lab down in Chile, 
uh, and also Arizona and Hawaii that handle the facilities, the roads, the infrastructure, the power, the water, and all that great stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so then we get to the important question. What does it mean to start the survey? We want to ensure that the system is producing the science valid images and data products uh, and, that, uh, and that the observing is efficient. So it's not just that we can get to those data products with any amount of effort, but that we can do it in a way that's sustainable and efficient so that we're assured that you know we're not starting too soon, that our time wouldn't be better spent um, making it more efficient so that when we start the survey, we're on that 10 year clock and we're and, 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 and just to just be very clear, so this will be DP2 will answer this question. After DP2, you will have an answer. Uh, one view is that by DP2, if it's as successful as we want, mm -hmm. we would have a great sense that those questions were answered. But but that's not, I mean, DP2 is, is, uh, is, is meant to be the science validation data sets, whatever we end up taking. It's possible that the science validation data sets would still get compressed and might not be the beat all end all that we had hoped. Um, let's see. So I wouldn't say DP2, just, just getting to DP2 or the data sets that form DP2 is, is uh, necessary and sufficient. It's probably necessary. So what would happen if the science, um, the, the image quality, for example, is not as good as you hope, then you have some ideas of how you could improve it. Would you still start? Let's so, get to that in a second. Because that's exactly the question, right? When is it better to start, even though it's not perfect, versus continuing to put a bunch of effort into making it better? That's, that's the big question. Can I ask quickly, is science valid images include science valid difference images? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the alert generation uh, will start uh, toward the end of that science validation period. Okay, so here, here kind of helps us. This is a great diagram that Jelko put together some time ago that we've been using uh, as a tool uh, and is continuing to be uh, very helpful. And we're now at the point where even more of the system is being integrated and as built things are coming into focus. So we'll be able to uh, update this tool and, and even uh, produce a new, a new version of it very soon. But consider the normalized A can do, which is really what we want to maximize for the survey, right? The product of the area on the sky versus the aperture uh, of the telescope. And so we can break that down into these factors. Uh, sensitivity factor, uh, an area on the, on the sky, angular factor, and an observing factor. Uh, and then multiply all that by our ops efficiency. So uh, the sensitivity factor is everything that, that just uh, converts photons that come down from the sky into a finally a count on the detector. So it's coatings, it's the efficiency of the detectors, it's the area of the, of the aperture. Uh, the field of FA is the field of view factor. So the total effective uh, area of the field of view, which could be, you know, could be something like vignetting would affect it, but it could also be a raft goes goes bad or a pixel, some number of pixels are not accurate, right? So it's just the total the total possible field of view that we can capture versus what we actually can capture. That should hopefully be quite close to one. Um, and then the observing effect, or can we can we uh, schedule this uh, uh, efficiently as we as we want to tile the sky? And then finally the ops efficiency. So all of that could be working perfectly. And, and the, but the, the thing that we need to do is every night we need to have a team that can run this system and that it's reliable and that we, we take data every time it's clear and the shutter is open. So all those things are, are things that we're working on understanding and, and maximizing as we go forward from here. They're dimensionless and normalized uh, and, and, and they're normalized in a way that corresponds to the science requirements design value so that we want that, that uh, to be greater than one, if we can get to the efficiency to be greater than one, or at least one. Um, and then, you know, you can understand how, how some things might not be that way, right? This, this reflectivity over time could change, uh, for example, a loss of sensor data, maybe, even though we hope it's quite unlikely. Uh, it's possible to find this simple quantity. Uh, it's an excellent numerical approximation for our goals. So this is the kind of thing that you can, you can keep in, in front of you uh, as we go forward, this very complex end phase. So this is the plot. Um, it shows the effective survey speed. 
how efficiently we actually take data. Uh, and it shows the system contribution to delivered seeing on one side, and then the site, the total delivered image quality on the other side. And the idea is that there's, there's, a, there's a, a region of this plot down here where it's green, uh, where the design of the system lives at, at basically one in efficiency and about a little less than 0 0.4, 0 0.35 maybe, in the system contribution to the delivered image quality. And then there's, but, okay. And then there's, a, I think I'll be done here in a second. We can open up for discussion. Uh, and then there's a, an assumption on the delivered image quality um, from the site and the current, the current values put it somewhere in here of uh, less than 0.8 or about 0.8 median. Uh, and then here, the forecast shows all, all those things that go into that efficiency equation where we think we're currently at. This is the thing that we need to update uh, mm -hmm. soon. But as of, of sometime last year, we were over here at a higher than effective survey speed of one. And so that's good. Uh, and if, if for whatever reason the scene gets better, we would be even better. Uh, if it got a little bit worse, we'd be okay. And then you can start to look at other regions of this diagram. And this is where it will come into uh, our discussion about what it means to start uh, the survey. So in an earlier discussion, uh, I think the PST and other members of the, the project science team and other members of the, um, uh, of the observatory had discussions and we, we kind of hatched out this gray area, which we say, is this acceptable for science? There's some degraded performance for one reason or another. And uh, through various arguments, which I can't reproduce off the top of my head, uh, it came to be that we decided something like even up to 0.7 arc seconds of contributed uh, image quality from the system. So that's more than double, or it's about double. It's exactly double, but it's 0.35, uh, would be okay to, to uh, still do science. That is, if that's where you ended up, you wouldn't just close, close up shop and go away. You'd still do, do science. Uh, and then, you know, if it certainly if it got much worse than that, it's not worth our time and energy and money uh, to continue. Again, we think we're down in here. How far up over here could we go? <coughs> so, uh, And I think I've, I've covered, covered all that. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the one we can't yet observe. When you talked about DP2, it will say a lot about this ops efficiency by the time we're done with, uh, done with the science validation surveys, which are the data set that will go into DP2, we'll know uh, about that observing efficiency. So that's a, that is a big, a big, um, big milestone coming up. And we'll, we'll actually know a lot about it, hopefully, uh, after commissioning camera, if it goes very smooth and we end up at this end of the, end of the commissioning camera phase, uh, being able to take a, a science data set instead of continuing to work on system integration right before LSST cam is ready to go on. So a proposed minimum criteria for LSST start. Again, going back up to the very top of the talk, all the system specifications that don't require more than SV data have been checked off, right? Some of them will require more data, 10-year depth and stuff. We can do some tests to get there, but, but there are some science requirements that we just won't fully understand until later. But anyways, the things that we can understand will be checked off. All the functional system requirements that don't require more than that will be checked off. So we know how the system is working based on what it needs to do. Um, to, to be successful and we've done it and checked them off. The science requirements will be done uh, and checked off. Remember some of, some of, we will just having finished SV data by the, by the apparent handover to operations, right? So there's a little bit of gray there where we say, yeah, we think it's all working right. We haven't cranked through, Keith's team hasn't cranked through all the data yet and documented it uh, because we've just finished taking it and we're gonna go into operations, right? So that's a little bit of a judgment call. And then for starters, for discussion, let's say we're better than that, that corner up in the other diagram of 0.7 mm -hmm. uh, image quality contributed by the system. I argue since that is still um, acceptable for some images, 
that it would that would be at the point where you could start taking data even while you were still working on getting back down here to the lower right part of the diagram. Uh, both the IQ, the image quality delivered, and the speed are understood with clear paths to improvement that can be done. Maybe, maybe they'll be done and we'll be hopefully just all be ready to go. Uh, other large surveys have started recently and gone through pretty, pretty straightforwardly from that system integration and commissioning phase right into operations. So there's, uh, there's, no, there's no reason to doubt that our team couldn't do the same. Um, and then we want to certainly assure that data management has demonstrated the processing at scale that's going to be required uh, and including the multi-site uh, and thousands of users who are going to become to be supported on our, our U.S. data access center. The uh, independent data access centers are not required to be fully online and working at the beginning of operations. Our goal is to get them on as soon as we can, but they may come a little bit later. But certainly the US DAC has to be up and ready. Uh, but even if it weren't, we would not stop ourselves from taking data. So I think that's, that's all the uh, kind of context and discussion slides I had. And now I would uh, certainly like to open it up to more questions. Certainly anyone on the project team or observatory that wants, or Marcio, go ahead. Yes, I was wondering about the uh, FO factor. Uh, mm -hmm. So what goes into it and what are the uncertainties there? Is, is it like satellite avoidance um, strategies? And things like that? that could be part of it. I mean, certainly if we spent a bunch of time avoiding satellites, that would affect it because that's basically scheduling the telescope efficiently so that it just keeps hammering out, you know, the 30 second snaps, the time for slew and settle, the next the next uh, observing thing. So things like that could affect it. Satellite avoidance would definitely be a hit on that. Do you have like a forecast uh, factor, an expected factor? I don't know what the current value of that one is. But maybe if Shelko is paying attention in online, oh, there's Mansi has her hand up. Okay. And of course I'm too. paying attention to Bob. Bob. Okay. I am paying attention Bob. <laughs> uh, satellites are still below 1% when you express it in integrated at undo. Thanks, Shelko. Yeah, so if you look at the current uh, simulations we've done on satellites, if you look at the impact of streaks across the images, it's a, it's a percent or so of pixels. So as Shelko just said, that clearly would be reducing the, the observing factor by a percent. Okay. So right now it's not a big deal. Why don't we go ahead, uh, Mansi? Yeah, just very quickly, so, um... Slide 13, you had science validation, survey, survey speed at 0.5, not at 0.7. Did you mean 0.5 or 0.7? For the survey speed, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yes, we hear you fine. was 0.5, but on the next slide, it was 0.7. Ah, which, yes. which one is it? Yes, the threshold for gray is 0.5 there. On your next slide, next slide forward, go to slide 14. It says no, no, uh, survey sorry. speed uh, as point seven. No, but the next line, next line, survey speed no, greater than point seven. There is no next slide. Next, next line, line. Oh, no, survey point. speed. Is, <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Yes, that's I, I think you. I think you cut an inconsistency. Thank Monty. you. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, I mean, this is this is. This is notional ideas. I guess a related question is, um, is there a role for, for the SAC or any other body for that matter? Yeah. To sort of help that, that guide exactly you through the this. Question, yeah. I mean, when, when one is, if one is in this awkward situation, um, uh, how, do you, how do you make the decision, the actual decision? Is it this outside committee or is it, can the SAC play a role or is there some other body whose job it is to help think this through? if we find ourselves in this sort of gray zone? I think it's an excellent question. I think obviously our, our internal project science team and others will help us with this, but I don't, I think, you know, it's like we said this morning, this is a big tent, we want all input. So I yeah. think uh, maybe uh, what would make sense is we give the SAC a specific ask on this. I think part of it is we need to convey what it means, what this means exactly. In this region and what and and come to some consensus about uh, when it's worth starting versus when it's worth uh, continuing to to hammer out 
Yeah, I mean, so it's maybe this is a, a, a technical answer to the question, but the way that we've set up our test planning during commissioning is to try to prioritize and get information about the fundamental capability of the system to acquire science grade data at the expected rate. Right? And what that means is that hopefully pretty early on in the LSST on sky commissioning period, we will have more technical information about where we stand and also what the specific technical issues are. And so I would expect that all of that information, all of that testing would be going into informing the, those types of evaluations. Right? To what extent do we expect that this is a fundamental limitation of the system or is it something that can be continually improved over time? Uh, and just to add to that, the good news is that you know we're going to start learning about some of this in a couple months. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm aware of the time. Uh, we've we normally had half an hour, but I think this is important. Gautam, then Charles, then Franz. Sure, Bob, if you can go to the next slide, 14, please. Um, two of the requirements that you had uh, on slide 14, I, I completely agree with. Starting taking data is great, uh, even if it's done early. But I'm a little concerned that clear paths to improvement and the second point about even if the US DAC is not ready, you'll start taking data, don't include an actual timeline for when uh, those those parts would be executed. So, you know, it's one thing to say that we can get the IQ to better than a system contribution of 0.3 or whatever, uh, but it's a different thing to say that takes one and a half years and uh, similarly, the US DAC being ready, but you're not going to have alerts for one year or something like that would be potentially unacceptable to some science collaborations. So I'd suggest, you know, that the, these requirements also include a timeline for mitigation for moving from the gray area to the green area. I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. And I agree. I mean, uh, that's what the intent here was, is that there has to be a it's not just this 0.7 or the efficiency speed of 0.5 or greater. It's how long would it take to do that? Um, I guess I confess in my mind, it's hard to imagine, even if you're dealing with other problems, if you have the telescope and you have nighttime sky, it's hard to say you wouldn't be taking data. You might be taking, I guess, other data besides survey data. Right. Uh, but I agree with you. We need yeah, to. I com yeah, I completely agree that you should take data as quickly as you can. I think the other thing to consider is, is it worth continuing to take data if, for example, uh, you can get a bigger improvement by taking the camera off and fiddling with it and then putting it back on? Is there some, What is the trade-off when downtime is actually worth it, which I don't yep. see on these slides. But Charles? Okay. Hi. Uh, I wanted to talk, Bob about the part of the construction which was already done, and you mentioned it briefly, and that was the EPO, right? To the extent that uh, EPO is the tip of the spear of operations, and it's already been going for more than a year, right? Since the um, it was signed off on in December of 2022 or thereabouts. What lessons have we learned so far uh, that we can get from EPO's successful operations activity at the moment that can sort of work up with this or add to the effectiveness of the whole CCR process from one to four? Uh, well, as far as, the, as far as the process goes, I think it was a great exemplar of working through the system requirements and specifications, which our systems engineering team went through with them uh, before and during the review to get them checked off and passed through the independent review. So that part uh, happened. It was uh, worthwhile and it informed the team about how that could work. And that will definitely feed right into uh, this next phase because a lot of it was, this, you know, it wasn't the same volume and the same um, number of things to, to look at, but it was essentially the same thing. And it was a, an interaction between the subsystem being handed off and the systems engineering team, which is a, is a key uh, element of this, uh, of this review and handover. So that part of it's good. I wish, uh, I don't see anyone from the EPO team here. I don't know what uh, else they would say in answer to your question. I know that they have uh, um, 
it, it maybe it is instructive to think and, and think back about it and and doing it in real time you know saying that you're you've now passed your ccr and and you've checked off the boxes and you're in operations uh what does that mean and how long did it take them to hit their stride now of course they're a smaller team compared to all the resources that will go into nighttime observing uh, but it did take some time to get going and uh, to hit their stride. And uh, I think it was certainly less than six months, but it was, you know, some, some few months. Right. I, I, I just, it, I'm sorry. It's such, a, it's such a good project example that we have set in Rubin that EPO is an equal branch of all the different things that are going on, that um, there's certain plenty of things that you could learn from that process and bring into this closeout process as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. Okay, and Franz, I, I think this will have to be the last question before we move on. Yeah, um, so this is semi-related to Gautam's question, uh, but basically um, in your platform slide 13, um, in terms of this, this x-axis fraction of, I guess, survey speed, where are the SCOC simulations? Are they set at one? or 0.9 or 0.8, maybe it's Lynn or you, I don't know who I think answer in, that. in principle, they were set at one, but have we done a detailed, uh, a detailed? Uh, well, I mean, effectively, say we started- Alex, is that where the case right? is now? Sorry? Yeah, but the, so so let's, let's assume they're set at one. And so if, if then we say, okay, when we're at survey C to 0.7, effectively what that means is, that we've lost 30% of, of the survey that we envisioned, which is effectively everything aside from the wide pass deep and maybe even some of the wide pass deep. So I'm not entirely, there definitely needs to be on the one hand, the debate about whether, you know, spend more time actually fixing the survey speed um, and not actually sort of going into operations. I think, you know, this balance that Gaitan was mentioning needs to be clarified a little bit better, I think. Um, the other side of this is my worry is that you you say we start operations and then therefore the end deadline is 10 years from that, but really year one isn't a full year, right? Because we're operating at 0 0.7 survey speed or whatever. And so um, how how is that going to be managed? Is it going to be managed? Um, are we just going to actually envision the survey, which might actually be nine years instead of ten? Uh, let me let me quickly answer the first question. So I think um, you know there are minimums. There are a set of minimum requirements, and that's what this gray box is. And then there's the design requirements, which we all want to get to. And again, I appreciate it. We want to be concise about what we mean to start the survey as opposed to finish the survey. And our goal is always to deliver everything in the science requirements document for the 10 year survey. And now if Kathy Turner would put her hands over her ears, uh, I'll say that uh, we, you know, we don't intend to start the clock until the survey is efficient and ready. Uh, and that's a discussion between us and the agencies, um, how we go forward. Again, the second okay, thanks. can be useful in that discussion if you'd like. Yeah. Um, with apologies, I mean, this is, this is, we could certainly spend an hour and a half talking about this, but we have other agenda items um, I want to ask Igor if he um, who's back there somewhere is going to talk to us about the discussions within uh, uh, the users committee, which requires finding the next of these presentations. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, it works. Yes, right. Good. Okay, take it away. Thank you, Michael, for the Thank invite. Uh, my name is Igor Andreoni, and uh, I have the privilege of being speaking to you today on behalf of the uh, Rubin Users Committee. Uh, some of the Users Committee members, as uh, you can see, also some faces here, are present in the room. Some are connected online. I encourage all of them to chime in or you know, help me answer a question and contribute to the discussion afterwards. And uh, if you see them around, please feel free to reach out and uh, discuss because all your feedback can be helpful to our meetings, our report, and uh, ultimately to benefit the community. 
for those who may not know, what's the charge of the users committee? Well, first of all, we want to prompt feedback from the community so that we can uh, discuss it, we can advocate for what the community think is needed to get ready for Rubin operations. And then we will provide this feedback from the community on top of the one from the community, also from our direct experience and our direct testing uh, so that it may be readily implemented as it has very nicely happened uh, in the past. And uh, to that, I think a big shout out to some key people, but in particular to uh, Melissa for the great work assisting the users committee. And uh, you can find um, in these slides, where if you go on the website, you will be able to download them, a bunch of links that could be useful if you want to know more from the detailed charge and what the community looks like in terms of institutions. It's an international committee. At least six people have to be based in the US, but others uh, must come from other countries, Chile, France, UK, and so on. Uh, we hold two meetings per year. And after each meeting, each discussion, there will be a report that is then issues and typically responded to uh, from the project, uh, typically within weeks uh, or months at the, at the very latest. Um, we're very easy to contact. I will say a few words about that later. And uh, now there is a feedback form that you can use to just tell us what you think, tell us what you need. And uh, this will remain uh, for, for, for the record, for, to help with each imminent meeting and for the future to understand a bit what the community has needed over time and how that has been addressed. And uh, here I'm just gonna provide some of the links uh, so you can uh, directly access uh, the reports that all of them can be found on community forum. So what, did, what have we provided so far? What are we doing uh, during and following our meetings? Uh, we are reviewing, commenting on the documentation, for example, uh, quite heavily on the science platform, uh, both uh, for the online version of it and the notebooks. So we do the testing ourselves on top of uh, uh, collecting feedback uh, from the users. And communication is a big thing. We need to be visible so that people can reach out to the committee and just find an easy way, an effective way to have their voice heard. Now on top of this feedback form that is available, uh, there is a dedicated topic on community forum. There is a mailing list. Uh, people are, um, we're very grateful that people are advertising the existence of the users committee and the channels to reach the users committee at various conferences and workshop. And, um, we are also, we have decided to individually target some of the users, typically those that uh, we already know, people who, if I call them by name, know who I am, or even some users that we don't know directly, but we want to establish uh, a first contact maybe. And this has been a very successful strategy. We have contacted almost 350 people uh, so far. And what specifically came from the community, especially the latest, that we have then um, communicated back to the pro project and got some action on. Uh, I think it's important to say a lot of the feedback was positive. So it's, it's not just collecting complaints, you're also collecting a lot of nice words, happy to pass them along uh, as well. And this reflects the great work that has been done. It doesn't come for free. Uh, generically, uh, people feel the need of having the documentation in one place and perhaps some easier version of the, of the documentation that uh, people new to the project or that want, uh, for example, ready information for grant proposals can, uh, can access and go from zero to hero as soon as possible. Uh, the, regarding the DP0 in particular, Overall, people are happy. There are some concerns maybe about the small sample available. 
and the scalability of it, uh, which I think links to the question that Franz has uh, also posted on Slack. And uh, there is a lot of question about the cutout service. I think part of the reason being the final decisions have not been made, but in general, if we manage to have more and more communication about these decisions when they're made, I think it would greatly help the users. So we've just received new feedback that we haven't yet crunched as a, as a committee. We will do that, I think on Thursday, is gonna be the, the next meeting and everyone is invited to attend in fact. Um, for example, this feedback concerns simplification of, of the queries, uh, some how in-kind software can be tested how, and how can that be done at scale. Again, scale is kind of a big word, I think, at this moment is one of the main concerns that we hope everyone um, will just think a bit harder on and then once again, communicate back to the community where we are at, what else we need, if anything at all. And finally, some question about integration of other data sets. And uh, now that people have basically finished all the tutorials available, I think they're asking for more. So if in the future there will be, even for more science cases, the possibility to have testable notebooks, it would also be greatly appreciated. Uh, and here, uh, this slide uh, kind of prepared by Daryl, we um, just want to remark how important it is for us to be a visible tool. Uh, so we're putting together from the feedback form to some slides that people can use. Basically, we want to provide ways to, make, to truly streamline the process of going from a concern, a question, some feedback to the community, to the, to the committee, to the project, and uh, all the way back. So some having some pre-packaged, pre-designed material that people can use. And I will stop uh, here uh, since Michael was mainly asking me, is the community ready? Mm -hmm. The vastly positive feedback is encouraging. Uh, I think we can still discuss whether there is anything else that, the data that should be done as part of data previews. Uh, community readiness on the science platform and beyond that. For example, we're not truly assessing how pe and people are using the brokers and how much and how ready they feel uh, for that. And, and what about co the collaborations? Will the role of collaboration have to evolve as well to truly accommodate the new needs when data start flowing in? So. Uh, room for a discussion now. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Igor. And there's, there's uh, plenty, plenty of issues here, and we, we have some time. Um, I wonder if I can actually ask Franz to articulate a little bit of some of the concerns that you already made brief reference to. So to put you on the spot, Franz, um, and, uh, and then, and then fine. Neil has his hands up. But yeah, go ahead, Franz. Sure. So, so the main concern I had is um, mostly in discussions with um, people talking about the competing resources, what's going to be available, what's going to be um, scoped out. And um, there's a lot of the sort of uh, actual hardware that's, that's going to be purchased is going to be for kind of backend things. A lot of the users are going to be interacting through cloud-based technologies. There's going to be a lot of querying across the internet that is, of course, a lag. Um, and then, of course, the, the main concern I have is just that the things that people might want to do, like access the entire catalog to you know, find some, some rare thing, um, those are things that individuals will, in general, not actually have the computing capacity to do, is my understanding. Um, and so communicating what is and what will not be available for the average user, right? Giving sort of a list of potential queries and saying, this is something that can be done um, once a month or once, you know, whatever. Um, or saying, for instance, this can be done, but only if you pay for extra resources, right? And so the cloud has infinite resources in theory, um, but, you know, and, and some costs associated with that so that people can say, oh, I need to actually pay for this. I'm going to write a grant, or I'm going to write this into my grant to to do that, right? Um, so these are kind of some of the things that I think need to be there in terms of communication 
for community readiness that are that are absolutely not. Um, and that's my concern. Uh, respond to that or are there? I think our main role uh, besides the testing is bring these uh, concerns forward. So yes. it's actually nice friends that you can do that uh, directly now. So this is definitely a concern that we can include in the next report. So especially I'm asking to the other members of the committee present in the, in the room and on Zoom to take note of that. Um, I'm curious maybe to hear more from the data management. So specifically, you said something about not being able to query the catalog, but that's exactly what um, you Well, so, so what I'm saying is, okay, I want to actually query every source in the catalog. That's exactly not something what an individual can do. Hmm? I don't understand what you mean by query every source in the catalog. That's so like so I would like to get photometry for every source. You want to extract the photometry of every source. So you want yeah. to make a sub catalog. That's a it, bit it weird. It effectively be the catalog. It is the catalog. It's there and QServe is there for you to query it. So why would you want to extract some part of that and not, or sorry, why would you would want to extract all of that and not just some part of it? I, th I think Frontier is concerned I'm just saying there's not going to be. Okay, so, so let's say I have a use case. I want to see what varies. Uh, between LSSD and something else, right? Um, it could be LSSD year one and LSSD year two um, in some way. So I want to extract all the columns and, and check them. Um, I mean, I, could, I can imagine people doing things like that, right? Um, that's my point. Uh, there will be some queries that just can't be done. And I think people should know about them. Um, as you say, like, okay, maybe you only want to select 0.001% of the catalog and then therefore the, the QServe will work, right? And it'll be fine. And that's maybe what a, a significant fraction of the community wants, but we don't know. And that's my worry is that the limitations of QServe and what, getting beyond those limitations will, will require has not been communicated. And maybe it's because, I mean, partly it's because it's not really fully scoped out and known, right? You're still working on how do we make this hybrid model work? But nonetheless, the community needs to understand what they're gonna be able to do or not. I, I see Leanne's hand is up. Maybe Leanne, do you wanna jump in here? Yes, can, can people hear me? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so first of all, I just wanna clarify Franz's question. I just wrote it in the Slack yeah, in case, but I think Franz, what you're wanting to do, is not so much extract one of the parameters, i.e. photometry, e.g. photometry, sorry, into a separate table that you would then go and do analysis on. I think what you are saying you want to do is a full catalog analysis, an analysis over all the objects in the catalog, but just say using some of the columns. Is that correct? Or have I right. misunderstood you? That, I think correct. that's okay. a, that, that maybe a typical use case is what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. And so that's more of a use case, not for QServe and not for executing ADQL queries on QServe, which typically will subset down a certain set of objects that match a criteria, but you'd more use, you would use uh, more a tool like Dask, for example, and part with Parquet files. Perhaps, um, but again, like how you do that, do you do that on RSP? Do you do that somewhere else? Like, I mean, none of this is really clear. And... No, not, not clear yet because we don't have these services yet. Um, we do provide right. Parquet files for all the data in, in the, um, uh, the, the, the catalogs. Uh, you can extract those Parquet files through the Butler. We don't yet have services like Dask running. For, for example, Dask, I'm not saying it will be Dask, yeah. but that's one of the The, services the, the other thing that Dask. is a concern is, is something you just mentioned, which is that um, general, you know, the, the way the QServe works is that it won't do concatenated uh, queries. And so essentially you have to download and put somewhere intermediate catalogs to, to advance through a multi-query uh, process. Do, do you, mean, uh, and, you mean nested queries where you have a query? Yeah, right it, it will not do a nested query. No, no, it doesn't. That's because of the distribution. And, and so that, that requires disk space. Mm -hmm. Is that sufficient? Like all of these things, I I 
people are sort of thinking about it, but I don't know if they're thinking about it in terms of the scalability that Igor mentioned for individual users. So what an individual user wants times however many individual users there are, I don't think that math works. And I think that needs to be communicated. Okay. Uh, we have hands up in here. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. Francis, uh, come stand on this side of the room. <laughs> Franz, can I paraphrase your question by asking uh, what are the limitations of the basic quota of storage and compute that are given to users? Yeah. Right. That's a very well known thing. You yeah. Know how much storage you're getting, <laughs> you know what the limitations are. I think I think if if you want to advance this, you need to give a, a use case that you say cannot currently be done, and allow us to see how we would achieve your use case because it's too abstract. My, my, my point is that we need to assess what is going to be the total use cases and then compare it to this thing. And as far as I know, I mean, so Knut has assessed some use cases from some users but that hasn't been scaled. And Knut has mentioned in a couple of, of, of talks that um, there is definitely a discrepancy between scaling those use cases, which already, just the users that he's asked have already maxed out the, the capabilities, right? I'm not saying, I mean, yes, one can do that calculation, but I guarantee that that information has not disseminated to 99% of the LSST user base. And that's my point. Okay, uh, we have several other hands up. Uh, and um, um, I think we're gonna go for a, perhaps another roughly 10 minutes or so. Uh, Neil, do you wanna uh, yes, please. make your point? Can you, hear, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, yeah, so, so Igor, I don't know if this is under your area of responsibility or, or, or not, but, but uh, in the AGN science collaboration, we have a, a good number of people who are very interested in helping out, but do not have uh, official uh, data rights access. Um, and so I just, th this is triggering me to ask about the, the, the current plans for data rights management. Uh, do we have, for example, a master list of everybody who's going to have data rights on the science collaborations and who does it, and um, how how will uh, that be guarded? I mean, how how do do we have a reliable method for you know authenticating and ensuring that the people who have data access get it, and the people who don't have data access somehow don't get start getting the data as well? Yeah, is this has been discussed also as part of the users committee. Is not our role to manage that part. But I think Phil wants to chime in about that. But thank you for the question. Okay. Yes. We, it's we an important one. A... I wasn't sure who was yes. responsible, but it's an important thing to sort out because it's, it's getting to where it's really going to matter soon. Yeah, I agree, Neil. So, so for at least a few months now, sorry, we've here. had um, uh, the list of data rights holders, all the PIs and JAs who have data rights through the International Link Dine program has been listed on the Rubin website under the International Data Rights Holders page. I think you can, you should be able to find it quite quite easily yeah. there. That's yes, I know. A, good. That's a, that's a view of, of the database that we are using. Call it a database, actually. It's a, a, a Google spreadsheet. It's, um, that is the list of people who have um, data rights. And we are currently using that very list to grant people um, accounts on the Rubin Science platform. So we're already using the system that for now is, is working well. We'll we'll see whether it scales to the full full 10,000 users if they if they all appear in the end. But that is the system we're working at the moment. Okay. And how how many users do you have at present? You know, compared to how many you're going to have? How much does it have to scale by? So Melissa can correct me. It's it's over a thousand. Right? How many users on the RSP right now? Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. There's I'd say over maybe a thousand people have taken an action to create an account. It's not the same okay. thing as. Uh, so how many actually have active accounts? Would you say you know? No. How many, how many daily users? Sorry. How many daily users? Daily users. Either. Yeah, that might be useful. I guess the, the real question is, how does that ratio with the number that you 
sort of are hoping for or imagining uh, once we're in full operation. You know, uh, Franz is expressing concerns that it's we're going to hit a crunch, and we want to get a sense of whether we've already pushed those limits or. Yeah, yeah. I think the the rough number to have in mind is we're we're a factor of ten away from where we where we sort of expect to be. Yeah. Um, both in okay. the number of active accounts and the number of people who've uh, taken some action. There should be a data preview session as well in the next few days, right? Okay. In the at the, at the workshop. There's a community but, session on Thursday. Yeah. Yes. So maybe that's where all those numbers may be flashed out on slides, maybe with uh, uh, some plots and visuals. Uh, we can ask the RSP team to bring those numbers to your meeting. Yes, yeah. that would be that would be quite interesting, and I encourage members of the SAC to go to the that session. We may find ourselves asking more annoying questions at, at that time. There's also okay. the okay. early science program at two o'clock today. It yes. come up then. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, any other? Questions from the room? Yes. Why don't you come on over here <laughs> so that people can hear you? Uh, a quick question because I don't know how much time we have. Uh, it's related yeah. to what Franz was saying about the uh, issues with the uh, scalability of uh, your RSP. Uh -huh. uh, talking with uh, other uh, Rubin users, it seems that one of the concerns is not just about the platform but the data in general. So there are also in kind contributions providing softwares simulations and it's like at least for these people it's not clear how this uh, simulation and software might be integrated within the Rubik's size platform uh, there are softwares for instance requiring uh, GPU or uh, processing power and so it's not clear if this can be run with a platform or data should be downloaded and then the classification software that they are providing has to be run uh, and while for the simulations, for instance, if it's something that it is a, of interest also for the AGN science collaboration, because one of the in-kind is producing a simulation of AGN. And so there is now an issue about how to deliver this simulation to the community, because it is mostly a storage issue. It's a catalog of uh, galaxies with AGN and variability on top of it. And now if we are trying to understand what is the best way to deliver this catalog. There is a hacker. And it is not in this room, but is participating, so he knows more about the simulations and the numbers. Right, thanks, Vincenzo, okay. who is also on the users committee, by the way. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, was supposed to be kind of captured in the comment about integration of other resources, could be observational resources like data coming mm -hmm. from other facilities like Roman, uh, to, for instance. Uh, or software, of course. So there, I think it's a problem in two levels. One, the people power uh, to make it bulletproof and integrate the different platforms. And this deeper level is where do you find the resources to run, for example, all of the GPUs needed for classification? I guess we can uh, actually start a useful conversation about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. The IDAX, what role do they play? Like, for example, this very specific example of simulations, right? Might it, might it be useful to have it at an IDAC and then point people to, okay, if you want AGN simulations, you go to this facility? Or is that I, I think that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable suggestion. And I think we need to, to discuss how that could happen. I think there's lots of simulations that people have been talking about. After all, DP0 is a simulation too, right? So. Uh, can't be done. Knut's going to lead an IDAC session later in the week. Some of these questions would be really good to bring up uh, there as well so we can capture them and maybe make progress on how we move forward. Okay. Um, any other? Um, sorry, Charles, I do see your hand is up, but we're kind of uh, out of time. Perhaps you can uh, put your question into Slack if that would yeah. be good. Uh, uh, totally we're, cool. we're, we're only 10 minutes behind schedule, which is not bad for this kind of thing. Um, actually, let me ask the organizers, how sharp is our cutoff at 12 o'clock? Is it okay if we go a little bit over? I mean, I think so. I mean, just two hour lunch break. Right, so. right, right. Okay, so it's just going to cut back into lunch. Okay, with that, uh, I'd like to move on to the, the next, uh, which is a combination of Eric, Lynn, and, and, um, uh, and Leanne uh, talking about uh, 
sort of a variety of questions within data management. Yes, that's the one. Um, I'm not sure who's gonna sort of lead this or Leanna, I don't know if you're the right person to do so or, or hi, uh, um, how you wanted so to I'm organize online. it. Yeah, hi, I'm online. Um, Eric and Lynn, are you there in person? Yes, we are. I can drive the yeah. slides if you want. Okay, okay sure. If, if someone who's there in person could drive the slides, that would be great. I think Eric, you're up first anyway. Sure. And I, I should just say that, uh, you know, this is not all of DM. This is a series of, of specific questions that the SAC has asked about just trying to get updates. Well, basically the list uh, that you now see on the screen. Leanne, do you want to make a, an intro comment before I dive in? Um, not really. I think Michael just covered it very well. They asked us a series of questions and these are our responses. So, um. okay. Do you want to deal with questions one by one as we go? Do you want to save them to the end? Oh, we'll, we'll jump uh -huh. in as, as, as needed. <laughs> We're not shy. Yeah, I think so. one, one by one's better because the topics do change. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I have I have three single slide updates uh, that were asked by the Slack about status of brokers, TIA, and uh, template images. Uh, I'm Eric Bellum, by the way. I'm uh, University of Washington and the science lead for load production. Um, so status of uh, alert brokers. Uh, I'll point you to a couple documents linked here in the slide. Uh, RTN 10 is giving us the overall strategy for uh, integrating brokers over the next year. Um, we're calling this integration rather than commissioning because the project is not levying any kind of formal requirements on the brokers. So we're trying to get them up to speed uh, and ready so that when we can start uh, releasing alerts, uh, everyone will be ready. And we have uh, seven uh, full stream alert brokers which will connect directly to the alert stream and uh, two at least uh, brokers which will operate downstream of those. Um, so we have begun that process of integration already. We're sending them simulated uh, alerts uh, from processing of simulated images is probably the best way to say it. So they run through our pipelines. Uh, most of them have already connected to the alert distribution system in the USDF. Uh, and as well, during the operations rehearsal four uh, that happened uh, back in June, uh, there were simulated images uh, at the summit that were sent through the long haul networks that were sent here to, to the USDF at Slack, triggered prompt processing, that triggered alert distri distribution, uh, and four of the brokers actually picked those up in real time. So other than you know, actually passing starlight through the optics and into the camera, uh, that really was an end-to-end -end test uh, and, and it was very successful. Um, successful in the sense that not only did they receive them, but they did stuff with them. In I don't know if they did. I, I, I that, didn't that, quite, I guess that's part of the spirit of the question. Yes, we, 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 didn't put, we, we have not been pushing them to do stuff with them. That's on the group of teams themselves, but they right, certainly right. received them. Uh, and we anticipate more tests of this kind uh, going forward with increasing scale uh, as we attempt to drive down latency, understand bottlenecks and so on. Um, so that, that work is, is going and we're having lively discussions about schema handling and everything else uh, with the broker team. Uh, I'll also point you to uh, RTN 61, this, another document which talks about uh, what we need, what we think we need on the project side to be ready to say, uh, we're gonna start sending alerts for real. Again, we anticipate that near the end of LSST CAM commissioning, uh, start of routine survey, start of uh, the formal LSST survey. And so it's helping us sort of have a punch list ready to go uh, to start sending those words. Muncie, I see your hand is up. Very quick question, Eric. Uh, what was the scale of operations rehearsal for how many alerts? And when is your next operations rehearsal for these to get a larger scale? Uh, great question. Operations rehearsal four was uh, simulated ComCam images at something like realistic observing cadence. I'll look to Keith if we know when our next rehearsal is. We have not yet scheduled operations rehearsal five, but we have had a tentative plan to schedule that sometime between the ComCam on sky test period and the LSST cam uh, on sky test period. And that would be an opportunity to test all of the infrastructure, but with an LSST cam volume of data. There's another question. Yes. Thank you. Um, are the alerts only astrophysical um, since the solar system things have to go through the helio linking system? Great question. 
So for these simulated images, uh, certainly in the operations rehearsals, uh, th th there are simulated solar system objects in them. We have not yet done the, uh, we've not yet integrated attribution of known solar system objects into our pipelines, but that's very close. And so uh, relatively soon we'll be able to say, uh, yes, we have detected a, uh, a, a solar system object at this position and this is its ID. And uh, so there's there are these two sort of elements of, uh, you know, discovery of new objects, but we will be annotating in the alert stream with, uh, you know, identification of known systems. And that's where uh, David Trilling's SNAPS broker in particular is expected. So, um, but would an alert for a solar system object just be for like a weird solar system object? You wouldn't want to alert on all. We, so, so the fundamentally we are sending alerts on every source that is changing or moving. Okay. And so, so, it, so it's it, everything. It, the, the alert, the, the name alert suggests it's important, but it's more like just a sort of a real time view of what's happening. And it's to the downstream user to say, this is something I care about. But, Igor? Just checking if this rehearsal or you know, behind closed doors or will these uh, alerts generated also possibly be distributed to the community and people can tune in? Great question. Um, so we have made a policy decision at the project side that we are only going to send uh, things to the brokers which can be treated as world public. Uh, so they are free, the brokers are free to make that data available to end users if they feel like they have capacity for it. You know, given, you know, we are evolving the schemas, you know, the, the input data may not always be that interesting in ways we can talk about. So it's sort of up to the brokers if they want to sort of make that effort or not, but there's nothing from our side that stops them from making it available. So we're never going to send anything proprietary to the brokers as alerts. Alerts are always going to be public. All right. Uh, all right. So we got a, the, a, a next question for our report on the status of DIA. And I got an excellent question from Franz uh, in, the, in the chat, which I can address uh, sort of as well here. Um, so uh, this is just a, a kind of a, a, a pointer to uh, other resources because uh, I, you know, have given hour long talks on this topic and probably will get to do so again uh, in the near future. But uh, we are continuing to uh, work on the difference imaging algorithms. This is the core of alert production. Uh, it also runs in the data release production uh, as well. Uh, we are using decorrelated alert and leptin as our sort of our baseline algorithm. Uh, we have made uh, some reasonable progress uh, in recent months, uh, eliminating a lot of sort of obvious artifacts uh, that we can just sort of push out of the pipelines uh, and, and uh, you know, give us less source volume to work with, speed everything up, uh, make our catalog smaller. Uh, we've done a lot of work on metrics and uh, some improvement on uh, source injection, which is really critical to being able to update our, our requirements. Um, I pointed to a talk from October, sort of giving uh, status to the science collaboration chairs. Uh, there's also a, a small update as part of the Thursday uh, science pipeline session. Uh, and then uh, the, there is a science unit and commissioning with some community members uh, who are contributing to this effort with a variety of expertise. Uh, and so we're looking forward uh, to the ComCam data. Uh, on the right is a simulated image uh, from ComCam mm -hmm. uh, that we uh, processed during uh, OR3. And, you know, it's not perfect, but I think it's a relatively clean example. I'm uh, sorry. So this, what we're looking at here is a difference image. Of a simulated image from ComCam. Uh, this is all simulated. And, and what we're seeing are a combination of actual sources and some artifacts and all that stuff. Yep. Some relatively bright, bright stars. Uh, and, and then, uh, yeah, the teal, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the cyan and blue are detected and detected negative. Mm -hmm. uh, solar system objects and variable stars basically in simulation, so there's no. Are those all point source injections or do you yes. have extended? Yeah, for, for this simulation specifically, they are point sources. We have uh, some code for injecting extended sources, uh, but it, we haven't yet fully integrated a complete sort of sample of uh, Injection catalog that covers a full breadth, but we will. What we'll is your do. timeline for that ballpark? Mm, just getting the um, just getting the um, framework merged, sort of now, and so I'd say next six months we're going to start improving that uh, injection catalog. But that's something we can do continuously. You know, it's not. There's no hard hard date for that. <clears throat> All right, uh, Franz asked a long question uh, online, which I don't have in front of me, but I'll try to. 
uh, see if I can summarize. You're welcome to look there if you want. He was asking, you know, about whether we have done uh, sort of a comparison of this baseline uh, uh, difference imaging algorithm to uh, others that uh, other implementations in the literature, Zogi, uh, SFFT, a few others. Uh, the short answer is yes and no. Uh, so we, we uh, need to have and do have a baseline implementation, a baseline algorithm, which is this decorrelated alert and leptin. Uh, we have some construction requirements that we need to hit, and so our aim is to do so. Uh, we are, of course, staying uh, abreast of the literature. Most of these different implementations are, you know, variations on a theme, and so we are uh, looking for ideas and inspiration as we try to tune performance uh, uh, and, and do better. Uh, we have connections uh, through the science unit, for instance, to the author of, of the SFFT implementation and so on. Um, uh, we do, uh, we, we will have to do a uh, fairly good quantification of uh, completeness and purity as part of our uh, construction completeness review. We have requirements. And so uh, that gives us an opportunity to, uh, to do those sorts of bake-offs and comparisons. Um, and we expect to do that going forward. We've been a little bit focused on uh, tooling and understanding the sort of overall framework we're running in. Um, but um, you know, we, we have more work to do, but stay tuned, I think, is the answer. Okay, for, uh, Franz, go ahead. I, yeah, just to stress my concern here, that you essentially are working with one algorithm and you don't know how much better it is or worse it is than the alternatives. And rather than continuing down that road until you are stuck, it might be good to understand where you're sitting at now. Um, you may already be on the road too far down and you're stuck, but um, you know, at some point it would be some point being sooner rather than, you know, once you actually have data coming in and are really stuck, um, it would be good to know how well this performs. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of shocked that this hasn't been done. Um, I, I want to dispute a little bit your your statement there, uh, Franz. I, I, I feel like all of these are these are families of approaches. They're not. It's not. There's a lot so of there's, overlap. There's, the, there's the the family of approach, which is the algorithmic whatever, and then there's the data, right, that it produces. And that, I mean, so there's sort of the you know the theoretical algorithm, and then there's the actual algorithm, and. I think it would be useful to actually compare the actual algorithms at some point soon, at least in you know a limited test, just to say like, hey, we're doing as well as we can, right? Or hey, yeah. we're not we're not doing you know this algorithm isn't performing as well as we expected to. It's down by twenty percent. It's giving extra bogus. It's giving more noise. Whatever. I so think I, I think a few, a few, a few further points there. I mean, we we have done we 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 did do some some years ago some extensive comparisons with Zogi, for instance, uh, and didn't see significant improvements versus uh, what we have. Uh, we do believe that in most cases we are performing near the state of the art. Uh, I would like to be able to show you a slide with you know pots and numbers. I don't have that right at the moment. I agree that's something we okay. need to have. If if you could um, link that in the the um, slack that would be useful because i i don't remember seeing it or so so a, finding a, it a pointer a pointer would be to the algorithm workshop we did back in 2020 where we already felt like we were seeing at that time uh you know raw uh false positive rates that were comparable to the state of the art mm -hmm. and we have since made further improvements um and again like i would i I absolutely acknowledge we need to update those, but um, I think I, I feel pretty confident we're doing well. Okay, yeah. and then the other aspect is is just the demonstration that you're you know the noise you're getting out of this is is what you expect, um, both at the source you know because usually, it, in many cases you take the noise as the global noise, and that's not the noise at the source, and you know then you assign it in an incorrect way. And so it would be also useful to to say like are you are you getting back what you expect, um, you know, at the positions of the sources and things like that. Um, I'm not sure if you, maybe you've done that. I don't know where that information is, um, but it would be useful. Let me to follow up. 
point off why yeah, thanks. Okay. Mariam, uh, and then a uh, quick question perhaps, and then we, um, I want to let Eric go on. Mariam, go ahead. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, so sorry, I couldn't make it in person. The global IT <laughs> problems throughout the, the flight. So my question is something that I haven't heard about, and sorry if I uh, missed it, but what if, if the um, PSF is not stable across the camera? So here you assume, right, when you do the difference imaging, that they all have the same PSF. Um, and, you know, historically, right, with other cameras, there was a problem, pan stores and so forth. So is, has that been addressed or looked into? I haven't heard much about that. Yeah, um, the, so the two, two a, a handful of, of, of points there. The first is that at least in alert production, uh, we process each detector independently. And so even if you have variations across the whole focal plane, uh, presumably those are smaller within the, on the scale of the detector. Even within the scale of the detector, one of the advantages of the alert and left approach is that it allows us to fit a kernel which has uh, spatial variations of the PSF across the focal plane. Uh, you know, we do absolutely, you know, one challenge that Ruben has is that uh, we have large spatial and rotational dithers that can create uh, boundaries, frankly, in the template that uh, are a little more challenging to account for. So, uh, you know, we are uh, aware and attuned to this problem and, and working on uh, a variety of approaches to address it. Great, thank we you. Should let I know you have many more things to tell I, just, us. Yes. I actually just have one more. Uh, there was a question yeah. about uh, access to template images. And I think the, the answer here is, or the uh, response here is, is simply that uh, template images are available uh, through the RSP with the same image services that all the other images are available. Uh, and that, you know, we expect to make those available uh, sort of, uh, it, you know, as the survey starts, uh, as soon as you feel like the RSP services are ready to support that. Yeah, so uh, there'll be a whole discussion of early, uh, early science and yeah. their you know, un understanding the details of this. People are, of course, anxious uh, to, I, to I, get going, as you very well know. And I'm, so, a, I'm anxious too. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so people will be pushing to understand that. Um, I don't know. Okay, so this is just a, yeah, an illustration of that and a pointer. Right. All right, I think then we're to Len. Is Linus here? Yes, here. Okay, fine. There's like three minutes left in the second. Uh, um, <laughs> we, we've gone a little over and we can go a little over. Okay. So, no, no, no um, yeah. Okay. Think, think, think 10 ish. Okay. All right, okay. Um, I think we can cover that and then. Um, so, maybe you should introduce yourself. Oh, a sorry. I, I'm Lynn Jones. I'm the uh, head of the survey strategy team for Ruben. Um, I actually don't know what the original question was from the SAC because I didn't see that. I got yeah. asked, can you talk about the, this question? Right, right, right. Yeah, well, this is, yeah, this, okay. the question, we're trying to understand stand this part of the question. Okay, yeah. so, so the, the question is that, that, that I thought I would answer is um, there is a non-uniformity challenge. So what does that mean? Um, the, so the yellow part of the survey is the extra, extra galactic focus part of the wide vest deep. Um, over this part of the survey in order to get the cadence improved, like so that we revisit um, more frequently and, and come back to a particular field with a shorter interval between nights. We um, use a rolling cadence. What that means, if you, if you haven't been following, following along with the survey strategy for the project is that we split the sky into these four different bands and in alternating seasons of visibility, we either focus on that part of the, the sky more frequently. So we, we shift observations into that season or in because we have only a certain number of visits we can distribute everywhere, or we have less visits in a particular season. So you kind of go uniform for the first year. And then in the second year, we start splitting visits between different seasons. So it'll be high activity, low activity, high activity, low activity kind of thing. And then at the end of the survey, we finished with um, uniform coverage over the whole sky again. So what is the non-uniformity challenge? If you do this rolling cadence, then at intermediate data releases between year one and year 10, your coverage on the sky is not uniform. You have some part of the sky 
which, um, which, which just has slightly more visits and then some part of the sky which has slightly less visits. And this is a challenge for groups who are trying to do uh, science that requires very uniform number of epics in their catalogs. Um, and so this is a challenge for DESK uh, in particular. So DESK have uh, major, are planning to do major reprocessing of the data in at particular intermediate data releases, um, picking out year one, year four, year seven, and year 10. We're uniform at year one because we don't roll in the first year. Um, that's uniform by design. We want to get um, coverage of the entire sky so that we can build up catalogs and, um, and, and get photometric calibration and so on uh, running. And year 10 is the, at the end of the survey, we're again uniform by design. So this leaves year four and year seven as non-uniform. So this is an example, the number of epics that if we, if we just continued our current um, start rolling at year one roll, keep rolling at year four, the number of visits per point on the sky would look like this. And so you can see that non-uniformity. That's the non-uniformity challenge for desk. Um, if you look at the extra galactic co-added depth, it's less obvious because um, you know depth M5 builds up uh, non-linearly. So you can't see it as well with your eye, but um, if you also care about the number of epics, which you do very much if you're doing things like uh, weak lensing and need to have epics of all your visits, then it doesn't, th this still matters. Okay, so, so that's, that is what is the challenge, is the fact that that's non-uniform. Um, we, yes, sir. So this is just an ex another example at, at your four, for example, if we roll or if we don't roll, if we don't roll, it's very uniform, but uh, time domain science is not a fan of this. So we want to roll, but then we have that, that non-uniform name. So as a solution, um, we can modify the survey strategy. So here's, I have to introduce the concept of cycles. So a cycle of rolling would be two seasons where you have one season you had high coverage and the next season you had low coverage or vice versa. It's just essentially two years, um, two seasons of uh, visibility. So with the default rolling uh, survey strategy that we have at baseline three point, uh, Four, which is where we are now, so post V3, we have four seasons. So we start with, sorry, we have four cycles of rolling. So we start with uniform, a uniform year, uniform season. Then we have eight seasons where we go high, low coverage. And then at the end, we have a uniform season. Um, if we reduce those to only three cycles, then we can intersperse uniform coverage in, in without throughout the survey. So basically we would have a year of uniform coverage, that's the, the first season. Then we have two seasons where we go high and low, and we have a season of uniform coverage to solidify the coverage over the sky so the number of epics are the same everywhere. Um, you're not introducing half of a rolling cycle before data release, basically. And then we would repeat two seasons high-low, one uniform, then a final set of high-low, and then the last uniform season. So. We did have some earlier simulations, by the way, where we only did three cycles of rolling, but we had more. We didn't intersperse those uniform seasons. We just had them at the start and the end. Currently, we're at four cycles of rolling. Um, and we have slightly shorter um, contiguous uniform rolling, uniform coverage at the start and the end. So this uniform rolling goes down one cycle and intersperses uniform coverage throughout the, throughout the survey. What this does is that at your seven, uh, four and seven, we're now at the end of this uniform period and then at the end of the next uniform period. And so at your four and seven, you get data releases that look much more like the non-rolling version. Um, desk have metrics that are implemented with math and that they've looked at the survey strategy and si simulations that we've made with this survey strategy. And depending on exactly which metric you look at, but you can see sort of 20 to 30% gain in their measurements in comparison to a current baseline. Uh, 
Um, and if I may interrupt, mm -hmm. what are the, the folks who are interested in the variable universe say? Yeah, so, they... so it very much depends on what time scale you're interested in. Yes, I imagine so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the SEOC, you know, obviously, as the SEOC are a subcommittee of the SAC, they're looking into this very closely and they have a lot more reports than I have time to present here. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, this, this comes down to the very short time scales are not strongly affected. Um, that's like hour or so. But where this really has an impact is on the, the one to two day um, return rate, because that's what's really boosted by adding rolling cadence. Now, we've gone from four to three to rolling cycles, but this doesn't mean we have a 25% drop in the two to three, one to two day return rate, because that happens naturally anyway. You know, there's a scatter in the distribution of how things are, are distributed. This is a, about a 7% drop in the return rate for coming back like within one or two days. So if you have a science case that is primarily driven by visits that are in about the 24 hour time scales, you'll see a 7% drop in your science return for this. But this is, and this is to be weighed against that sort of 30% gain that the desk has. Okay, Simona. Yeah, so I thank you. This is great to see that the, the new rolling sequence has been integrated in the SOS, SOCS. And <laughs> I'm wondering, um, so it's great for galaxies and desk science. And I was really looking forward for the more uniform data year four and seven. I'm wondering what is the impact on transients if you can quantify it. So you say that uh, is reasonable? Can you quantify it better to know uh, how much they will lose in terms of data and science uh, and scientific results? Yeah, so so it is because there's such a variety of, of transient science and there's a lot of transient science that falls into sort of an unknown region and Eric can as, as one of the contributors to metrics that's looking at metrics uh, you know, revisit in this particular time range can say like it, it's not, there's a lot of unknown science that happens at these sort of time scales. So when I say we drop the revisit rate, uh, the, the fraction of times that we revisit a field by about 7%, that will be reflected in science that is looking primarily driven by this 24 hour time scale, which means that if you're looking for kilonova and trying to classify them um, as a kilonova, that's a 7% drop. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a really clear, like this is a particular thing. There, there are other things that we don't, um, we maybe don't necessarily know about, but the kilonova science stands in for a lot of this and, and that sees a 7% drop. Um, the a lot of science, transient science is sort of more sensitive to timescales that are a little bit longer. So um, the supernova metric as run by desk themselves, where they have a more sophisticated supernova metric that we run, shows um, a little bit of a drop. It's, it's uh, it might actually be a few about the same order. Maybe they have a note that they're submitting. It was a little bit bigger, but acceptable. Yeah. Game. Yeah, I thought I, yes, I, I don't remember the exact numbers. So it's, it's true. So, um, so it's, so you're, you're looking most likely about, about something about 7%. Um, yeah, we should think about, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so the SEOC is looking into this question. One of the points that I wanted to make sure everybody realized is, because the first year is uniform, no matter what, because we have to build those for metric catalogs, um, there is some chance that the SEOC will push this decision off as a for a final decision, um, especially like, once we understand a little bit more about like the efficiency of how we'll be observing the sky in that first year. So there, there may be, it may be that your answer here is we will most likely do X, but we will decide for sure in a, in a few extra months or in a, in a year. Um, I 
did not make this slide, so I wonder if it's uh, Leanne's slide. Hi, Lynn. Yeah, that's my slide. Can people hear yeah. me? <laughs> yep. Yeah, okay. So, so this actually comes back to uh, the first thing Lynn said at the beginning of her talk is what was the actual question? And the actual, the question that was really asked to us is what are data management's plans for building COADs spe specifically to address this non-uniformity challenge that Lynn has just outlined? So Lynn has provided the background to what it is um, and also the solutions that are being considered uh, through the optimization of the survey. Uh, at a point about a year and a half ago, DES came to us and they were concerned about um, they were concerned about the fact that the survey strategy might not be able to incorporate um, uh, a solution to this non-uniformity challenge and asked us what the possibilities were in data products if we could somehow fix fix this in software. And so we had a long discussion. And I think the, the, the question that came out of this discussion really was what level of non-uniformity matters to the desk cosmology analyses? Um, I mean, bear in mind, Lynn has presented you with sort of non-rolling um, survey strategies that are in principle we're calling uniform, but they're actually not completely uniform, right? There will be a non-uniformity in depth to some degree, even without rolling cadence. Um, sure. And I, I know Lynn didn't mean to imply that there wouldn't be, but I'm, but I'm just highlighting that point. And so, um, so the desk went away and they thought about, you know, what level of non-uniformity matters and they developed some metrics around this. So desk know they have to handle this non-uniformity. What they're concerned about is having a, an additional level of non-uniformity on top of what would naturally be there um, because that proper errors get propagated uh, through the fact that it's really hard to measure that <laughs> non-uniformity perfectly and then those errors get propagated into the cosmology analyses and has worse output for cosmology. So the goal really here is to homogenize the depth across the sky to the extent possible to minimize that propagation of errors into the cosmology analyses. So um, uh, at the time we had that discussion, um, we did consider a few options in how we might do this in software. None of them are very good, and I'll, I'll run through those on the next slide. But just, as a, as just to, to mention a recent update, at the desk collaboration meeting in Zurich, uh, only about a month ago, less than a month ago, the observing strategy update talk reported on this non on this uniform rolling cadence that Lynn has just described, which was advocated to have uniformity at years one, four, seven, and ten for static science, and they indicated that that would um, that would that would um, improve the situation a lot with minimal effect on their transient science. So what I think we're waiting for now is uh, further guidance from the SCOC to understand if this uniform rolling cadence will be adopted or, or not. Uh, next slide, please. So just to, just to uh, present what we did consider, um, in data processing in software, let's say we have, uh, we execute a survey with a lot of, that comes out uh, like, like the, the rolling cadence that Lynn presented with a lot of non-uniformity in one year. The only real way to homogenize the depth across the sky for a given data release is to remove coads from a coad to, to sort of force uniformity in depth. And this means excluding good data from a coad, which is not a good idea. <laughs> um, the other way we could do it would be to add noise to the data, but that also only downgrades good data. So that's also not a good option. Neither of these options are good, and they will also degrade other science. So I'm sure other sciences don't want coads that are suboptimal. Um, additionally, we are not scoped to produce um, various different varieties of coads targeted at different science. Um, and uh, this, um, this, if we were to do something like this, would constitute a, a very large cost added scope increase as we would have to produce two sets of coads with the ones we're planning and then an additional set. Um, so right now, I would say, to answer Michael's very specific questions, we have no plans at the moment to implement any <coughs> data process solution to this non-uniformity challenge. The best way to address this is in the survey, and I think we want to sort of exhaust that option first, and if there's still issues, then maybe think about it afterwards. And as Lynn said, this will probably be um, uh, this will probably be put off maybe until uh, uh, the survey starts, because year one is going to be uniform uh, in any case. Okay. Um, is that, that's the last of the slides, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Okay, um, we're, 50, we're 15 minutes over our nominal schedule. Uh, I know uh, lunch lunch is uh, available. Are there any burning questions from members of the Science Advisory Committee at this point? Um, the next thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna, the executive, ah, Muncie. Yes, go ahead, Muncie. I just wanted to push back on Lynn's first point here about excluding good data from a Add, it's not excluding it, right? It is you're going to include it in the next data release. 
So it's only sort of a temporary exhibition to meet the uniformity. Yeah. So what was what was so bad about that? I, I didn't even catch that. So Monsi, you're a little bit difficult to to uh, understand. Maybe again, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Is the question why don't we do you just make a different co-op? Or so it's just a temporary removal of data. When is it? Yeah, but oh, okay, it's just, it is just temporary. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's okay. So I can't comment on data management plans, but um, I, I think the idea is that it would be it would still be non-uniform until you're ten. I, I think even if it's temporary, like anytime there's a like you you can't temporarily make a uniform school and that the increase of depth and yeah. not be uniform. So I mean just still to, be, be to be clear, just saying just leave out some coeds is not that simple. It's like a lot of work. So I'm gonna yeah. have to figure out how to do it, which yeah. ones to leave out, how to make it better. So it's not just simply leave it out. And we would not want to do that. That will decrease the product, the, the science quality of the product that we would release for each data release. And it's also bad for desk. Like yeah. they did look I, I, at this. I, I, right. Even, yeah. I mean, this was like the, the last yeah. resort solution. Like, let's discuss yeah. it. Is it it's even making yeah. sense? Um, it was not like our first thing to go in there and saying this is what Yeah. And it was, a good, like, it was a good discussion. Yeah. But yeah. I think we're, we're not at this last resort yet. Which is a bit hard to watch. Okay. Um, they, they, they can't hear they can't hear you um, you need to be on the side of the, the, the table but um, we are uh, we, again we've gone uh, 15 minutes over I would like to ask members of the SAC if you would be willing to uh, for us to have some discussion I think at this point I'm going to thank all, all the speakers um, let's do so Uh, and Before everybody leaves the room, just one thing. So on Zoom, people were complaining when people left, uh, went outside the door. It was really loud on Zoom. So if you are in this room again for any parallel session and you go in and out, just try to be a little bit softer with the door. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Again, members of the SAC, both in person and on Zoom, please stay on. And everybody else, uh, well, I think what we want to do is synthesize a, a little bit what we've heard and sort of uh, push forward. And, uh, and uh, that, that's otherwise the end of the session. Yeah. No. Yeah. So Have a nice I, I would also tell that, that like, so guys, um, yes, have written up like and, and, yeah. and have a note that describes like these metrics that I said it's about thirty percent. But we did not give us permission to share it yet. So they just need to. I think I don't know if it's because you know just like caution. Oh, we didn't realize that was good. We were writing that for, for the SEOC. We didn't realize it was going to go elsewhere. Um, and they're also there would be a problem. Probably know about that. Okay, uh, members of the SAC. You can uh, sort of. Uh, I'll ask those those people on Zoom who are not members of the SAC to uh, connect. Those who are here, uh, let's spend a little time trying to gather our thoughts. We're just waiting for people to. I uh, don't. I actually think about that. Life is busy, right, yeah. for everybody, and, and so I don't like necessarily. Done so it. people like, said oh, they understood the people there if they were loud. Oh, they did. Yeah. Oh, okay. They spoke okay. loudly. Okay. Good. Oh, okay. 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 Okay to leave, or maybe they've they've wandered off and are not paying attention. I don't think anything we're saying is so top secret that, that uh, we have to worry too much about that. But uh, those people who are on Zoom can continue to hear us okay? Okay, yeah. good. Maybe, yes. maybe you all can just uh, unmute yourself at this point, because it's right now in the room uh, is, is just uh, um, Melissa and uh, 
uh, Marcio and, and Henry, myself, and Katrin. And so it's modest numbers. I'm sorry, did you? Did you? I think it's good. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're good. 